I'm Jennifer Miller. I'm the initiative lead of Global PDX. And thanks so much to all of us for joining us today. If you can have your video on, we'd love to see your faces, but of course we understand if you're busy with other things. Uh, quickly, I'd love to tell you about Global PDX. We're Oregon's hub for global change makers. And we connect a community of local people around Oregon who are doing work that has a big global impact. So we're so happy to connect in with all of you. And of course, delighted to have Michaela Schweitzer Bloom with us. We have worked with Michaela before and obviously love anytime our diplomat in residence swings by to give us some tips on working for the government, working in diplomacy and so many other things. And we're so happy that you guys are excited to hear from her as well. Uh, as we get started, I would love to do just super brief intro with uh, hearing each of your name, your background, and then just really briefly why you're interested in this session so that Mika can sort of tailor her answers to your interests. Um, I'm happy to go first. I'm Jennifer and I actually worked in the Peace Corps for quite a while. So a piece of why I'm really interested and excited to be here tonight is hearing more about what Mika's thoughts are on the Peace Corps, sort of reinstating that, seeing how people are gonna go back out into the world post 2020 and, and what that might look like. Um, and that's just a little bit about me. Uh, Megan, can I pass it over to you? Yes, hi, my name's Megan. I am Mika's um, uh, intern and I am currently a senior at the University of Washington studying political science and law societies and justice. Nice to see you all. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here today, Megan. Uh, Omar, how about yourself? Hi everybody, uh, my name's Omar. I am in Philadelphia. I work for uh, a bank. Uh, I do community development banking work, uh, but I've always been interested in, in international development, uh, especially finance. Uh, I worked for a brief period of time, the US um, Commercial Service through their export uh, assistance offices and was there briefly and then transitioned into more of an economic de development role, uh, but would love to do that in an international uh, kind of realm. But so uh, just looking to connect and network with folks. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Rachel, how about yourself? Sure. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself and that took a minute. <laughs> um, so my name is Rachel. I live in Portland, Oregon. Um, similar to Jennifer, I was also in the Peace Corps. Um, so that was my exposure to international development work and also a little bit around um, diplomacy and what the Department of State does and all of that important work. So I've always kind of in the back of my mind had an interest in what that realm would look like and what opportunities are available there. So um, just am curious to hear a little bit more about some lived in experience um, from Michaela and to hear about other folks and their interests as well. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, Abby, how about yourself? Yeah, um, I would turn on my camera, but unfortunately I forgot that my computer's camera is broken. Um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, my name is Abby. Um, I just graduated from the U of O last year in 2020. Um, I'm not currently working in the international development community. Um, I did intern with a couple of Global PDX's partner organizations um, in college, including um, Mayusa and Create. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. which are both awesome. based in Eugene. Um, yeah, and I think that I am just joining to uh, just kind of hear about um, life in the Foreign Service and ex life, I guess, working in international development. Great. Well, thanks so much for being here tonight. Those of you just joining, we're just going around and sharing our name, a little bit about our background, uh, and then also our particular interest in this session tonight. Uh, Tabitha, how about you? Hi, sorry, I'm cooking at the same time. Oh, no um, problem. <laughs> poor timing. Um, I am a Portland, Oregon native, but I have also lived in Alaska and worked three years in Japan in the JET program, if anyone's familiar with that, Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. And my last year there, I worked for the prefectural government. So the idea of working in international relations inside of a government has kind of always remained in the back of my mind, although currently I work in international education at um, Mount Hood Community College. Great, awesome. We're so happy you're here with us tonight. Uh, Mark, how about yourself? Um, 
Hi there. Uh, so is this just introductions? Sorry, I missed the first bit. Yeah, just your name, your background, and then a little bit about why you're interested in this particular particular session. Um, yeah, well, uh, I had an interest in um, diplomacy and international development for a while. It's not where I work. I work in the kind of the clean energy sector, running um, energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. Um, formerly in the state of New York and now for the last like six years or so here in Oregon. So um, uh, yeah, I think just sort of general interest, curiosity. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here tonight. Um, Eloise, how about yourself? If you don't mind just your name, your background, uh, and a little bit about why you're interested in this session tonight. Do we have you, Eloise? Oh, Eloise says one second. Um, Patrick, if you don't mind, I'd love to pass it over to you. We're just doing super brief introductions, your name, your background, and then a little bit about why you're interested in the session. Hi, everybody. Um, I live in the house with a bunch of scarves. See, there they are. Um, uh, I'm, the, I'm the program director for People, Places, Things. Um, and I just love connecting people all around the world. And we're doing that a lot virtually lately. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here tonight, Patrick. Eloise, are you ready? Or we can we can pass by if it's not working for you. I think Eloise might be having a little trouble with audio, but Eloise, feel free to drop your introduction. Oh, wait, did I hear you? Oh, hi. Hi, <laughs> So Eloise. sorry. <laughs> I'm having a little technical issues, but um, yeah, I'm Eloise. Um, uh, wait, sorry, can you remind me what I'm supposed to say? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Just a little bit about your background and then why you're interested in this particular session. Yeah, so um, I went to U of O and studied international studies and political science. So um, yeah, diplomacy and all this is up my alley. And yeah, I'm really excited to learn more. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And I love that we have a good variety of backgrounds. And I know Mika likes that too, because one of the things that I always hear from her is that it can be all backgrounds, all levels of expertise. And there's always a, an excellent role for you with the U.S. State Department. So Mika, with that, I'd love to pass it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. It's really a pleasure to be with Global PDX again. Um, and really nice to be with you all this evening. Um, great. As, as Jennifer said, it is really great to see people and to talk with people from so many different um, uh, activities and, and uh, areas of expertise. So um, tonight I have a presentation that I'll share with you about opportunities that are with the Department of State um, and um, the variety of opportunities that exist and then the um, path to join. Um, and as I'm talking, I'll try and give you a bit of information about uh, what it's like to work and, and live in the Foreign Service. Um, and then I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and share a presentation. And if you guys will bear with me, um, Zoom has a new beta uh, screen sharing thing, so um, which uh, as a presenter seems to work a lot better. So I'm going to test it out with you guys. If it does not work, we'll ditch it and I'll go back to the traditional way of doing it. But um, I think it's going to be pretty cool. So uh, let us see if that works. Um, and of course, it's already creating. Oh, there we go. All right. sharing slides. <laughs> if this is going to, if they, if this bandwidth is not going to work. Nope, there we go. Awesome. All right, let's see how this goes. Um, all right. Uh, I have a little spinning dot. Oh my gosh. Oh, that is not what I wanted. Okay, guys, hang on. We're going to ditch this process. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth a try. <laughs> As I stopped sharing. That is not what I wanted, but I appreciate you guys letting me test that on you. All right, so we're going traditional here. <laughs> okay, um, hopefully you guys can see that. Um, 
and it should work just fine. All right, so I always like to start with just a little bit of context about the Department of State. Um, as you guys know, we are uh, the US government's primary foreign affairs agency. We help formulate foreign policy uh, out of our headquarters in Washington, DC. And then we execute that foreign policy out of our over 270 different embassies and consulates around the world. Um, we are the oldest cabinet agency, um, uh, and um, we have a long and uh, fine tradition of trying to advance U.S. interests and represent the interests of U.S. citizens around the world. Um, in terms of who we are, we actually have several different categories of employment within the Department of State. Um, I'm going to focus on opportunities for U.S. citizens, but I will just note that actually the largest uh, portion of our employees are citizens of other countries. That's that locally employed staff number there at the bottom. Um, these are folks that we hire at all of our embassies and consulates um, to work with us. Uh, they spend whole careers with us um, and provide local knowledge and expertise and everything from policy to programs to operations. Um, and we really could not do what we do without them. For US citizens, there are two career paths within the Department of State, and that's the Foreign Service and the Civil Service. And I'll talk about both a little bit. But just kind of broad brush, what's the difference? The Civil Service is US based. Um, the Foreign Service is primarily overseas based. Um, the Civil Service home bases in one place, whereas the Foreign Service rotates around, moving every two to three years. Um, the other big difference is that the Foreign Service does tend to, by default, have to be more generalist, and the Civil Service become real subject matter experts in their fields, again, on policy programs, operations, because they do tend to stay in one position for a longer period of time than a Foreign Service employee. Um, so that's the, the big difference, and I will go through all of those with you guys. Um, I am a Foreign Service officer um, or generalist. I have been in the Foreign Service for over 24 years now. Um, I've served in a variety of different places um, and I've served in a variety of different capacities. And I'm gonna go into that in just a minute. What does that mean, this public diplomacy coned and tracks and everything? Um, I'm also married to a fellow Foreign Service officer and we have three children who um, have grown up in the Foreign Service. So I'm happy to also answer questions about the life of being in the Foreign Service. Um, because it is more than just a career, it is a life that does involve your whole family. Um, foreign service uh, generalists and officers, um, in the foreign service we have generalists and we have specialists. Um, and um, generalists uh, can work in five different career categories. Um, and let me go into these a little bit so you can get a flavor for what the kind of work that we do is. Um, I'm going to start with public diplomacy because that's my career track. So when you come into the Foreign Service, you are you select a career track that you want to focus in and you're hired into that career track. Um, so my primary career track is public diplomacy. And that means that my job is to engage with public audiences in other countries um, to try and enhance understanding of the United States, what we're about, who we are. Um, and I do that uh, using a variety of different tools, exchange programs, cultural programs, media engagement, speaker programs. Um, my job is to take our policy and strategic objectives in a country and to say, OK, how can we best represent these and help create the environment for success for these? by engaging with public audiences. So a lot of what you're doing as a public diplomacy officer is strategic planning. You're looking at objectives and trying to translate that into strategic programs. Um, you also are the program a lot of the time. So a lot of media engagement, a lot of going out and being the speaker yourself. So public diplomacy officers do have to be comfortable with public speaking. Um, and I have done public diplomacy um, in a number of different countries, um, including uh, when I was in uh, Egypt and Iraq and Jerusalem. Um, 
uh, during, I was in um, Egypt uh, 2003 to 2005, and then Iraq, and then Jerusalem. So it was a time when uh, we were pretty active and engaged in uh, issues in the Middle East. Um, so uh, presented some unique uh, public diplomacy challenges and opportunities, I would say. Um, in the political and economic uh, career tracks are what we call reporting. Um, and political and economic officers are responsible for tracking specific policy issues, um, making contacts uh, and gathering information from those contacts about what's happening in those fields. Um, they then do analysis, um, looking at where are there, there uh, synergies with US interests or where are there divergences with US interests on those topics. Um, and then they write reports informing Washington and the foreign policy making process of uh, what's happening and making recommendations of where the US might need to be engaged. They also are the voice uh, of US policy, representing US positions on those issues, engaging with people uh, uh, to try and be um, persuasive about what the US position is on these issues, um, to try and achieve our objectives in a country. So for an example, when I was in Kathmandu, um, I did political work and my portfolio included human rights, refugee issues, labor issues, Nepal's relationship with India and China. Um, so I made contacts in those fields, um, gathered information and, and did a lot of reporting. When I was in Croatia, I did economic work. Um, and there I was looking at economic trends across the former Yugoslavia. So I actually was a regional economic officer. And I was looking at financing issues, trade issues, tariffs. I was looking at opportunities for US businesses and trying to create linkages um, and opportunities for US trade uh, and investment in the region. Consular officers are really the heart and soul of the Foreign Service. They were the first ones sent overseas by George Washington. Um, and they are responsible for facilitating legal travel to the United States um, and for assisting US citizens who are overseas. Um, it's such an important part of what we do, the consular function, that in fact, every Foreign Service generalist or officer must demonstrate that they can successfully perform as a consular officer before they get what's called tenure. So every Foreign Service employee is reviewed for tenure at about year three or year four. Once you secure tenure, then you get to stay for a full career. So for Foreign Service officers, you have to demonstrate you can do consular work. Management officers are the ones that make it all happen. They are our global business managers um, doing everything from finance, human resources, property, supply chain, communications. Um, they negotiate the terms of our presence with every foreign government um, and negotiate contracts uh, to provide services for our missions. So a really critical function. We also hire folks into what we call the specialist career track. Um, and Whereas generalists we hire for their general knowledge and general skills, specialists we hire for their specialized skills and knowledge. Um, and we hire folks, uh, this is what I think most people don't know about the Department of State and the Foreign Service is that we actually hire people with this kind of technical background and expertise, um, particularly in our IT management. Um, you know, we're a global organization spread out all over the world. We have to be able to communicate and communicate effectively and quickly. Um, so our data and communication networks are both our unclass and classified are really critical elements of our operation and uh, we hire folks who can do that kind of systems management. Um, we also hire folks with engineering backgrounds both into our security division and to our buildings and operations. Um, and then one of the benefits of being in the Foreign Service is that uh, we have our own medical division uh, that provides medical care for all of us and our families when we're overseas. Um, so we do hire nurse practitioners, physician assistants, doctors, psychiatrists, uh, laboratory scientists uh, to provide that, uh, that medical support. Um, on our business side, uh, we hire specialists uh, to focus on specific business operations. So we hire folks as financial management uh, specialists, 
a supply chain specialist, that's our general services officer, uh, HR, and then our facilities managers, that's a great job. I always say if I wasn't going to be a foreign service officer, I was going to be a facility manager because I think it's such a great job. Um, you're sort of like the town manager for an embassy campus, uh, managing all the buildings, grounds, utilities, operations, um, managing the biggest section in the embassy for sure. Uh, a great and fascinating job. Um, and then we hire folks into a couple of unique opportunity fields. Um, our diplomatic security division uh, hires folks as special agents, um, don't actually have to have a background in law enforcement or security to be hired as a diplomatic security special agent. Um, but uh, uh, you are an actual law enforcement officer when you are hired as a special agent with responsibilities for all of the security programs around the world uh, to keep our people and our facilities secure. Um, also responsible for international investigations, um, the security of our visas and our passports, um, and also security diplomacy. So DS special agents do a lot of, uh, they facilitate a lot of training programs to try and enhance the rule of law, accountability, and transparency. We also hire folks uh, in support of our public diplomacy programs with specialized skills in public engagement and in the English language. Uh, these folks help design the programs that we do implement uh, in various countries uh, to do outreach. There is another uh, opportunity. This is not a career. Um, it's a bit of a different program. Uh, for this particular program called the Consular Fellows Program, we look to hire people who already have uh, language skills in four specific languages. So that's Portuguese, uh, Mandarin, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, and we created this program a number of years ago because we found that we had an increased demand for our consular services in countries where these languages are spoken. So to augment our ability to provide that service, we created this program to bring people on for a period of no more than five years to work as a consular officer. Again, that's doing uh, facilitating legal travel to the US and providing assistance to American citizens. You get all the full uh, benefits and advantages of being in the foreign service, um, but it is just that five year limited term. A lot of people do this uh, to, just to maybe they want to have a bit of a foreign service experience, but they don't want to commit to the whole career. So they do this program. Um, sometimes folks do this between undergraduate and graduate school. We do have a loan student loan repayment program that this is eligible for. Um, and sometimes folks just do it because it's interesting. Um, this program has no age limit. Uh, the foreign service actually does have an age limit. You have to join by your 60th birthday. Um, but the Consular Fellows Program, because it's only a five-year program, does not have an age limit. So we have some retirees who have come and joined us in this program as well. Some of the benefits, um, I, I've mentioned a few of these, um, but um, you know, beyond the just the benefit of seeing the world and the benefit of doing purposeful work, um, there are some really uh, good uh, concrete benefits. Um, our pay is very good. Uh, we get uh, compensation on top of that, depending on where you are and how difficult the place might be. Um, I mentioned the student loan repayment program. When you're overseas as well, you get free furnished housing and your children's education is paid for K through 12. Um, so that provides uh, some great benefits. Um, good uh, leave programs, uh, medical insurance programs, um, and we get really good training. Um, I should say that um, in my 24 years in the foreign service, I've spent three and a half years um, doing nothing but being a language student. Um, so I spent six months studying Nepali, two years learning Arabic, and 10 months uh, learning Macedonian. Um, and that was my full-time job. I was paid to just study a language. Um, the Department of State also sent me back to school. I earned a master's degree um, at, the, at the benefit of the Department of State, which was a really wonderful opportunity. And on top of that, we just get a lot of good professional uh, management leadership, uh, you know, a lot of good professional training. 
We also know, as I mentioned before, that this is about more than just the, the employee, it's about the family. Um, and so we do have opportunities for spousal employment programs. Uh, we have offices that are really committed to looking at the whole family, making sure that we have working with our schools, working with just our community, creating opportunities to make sure that it's a good experience for the whole family. Um, and it is, um, you do get uh, to be part of a bigger family as well, the foreign service family. Um, it's not just a job. It is really, uh, you are joining the foreign service family and you have that community all around the world. When we hire, um, we are looking for uh, particular qualities in our employees and we call these the dimensions. Um, and this is true for all of the foreign service positions, generalist and specialist. Um, our process of evaluation uh, really does, after we identify whether or not you have the specialized knowledge or the general knowledge that we need for those two categories, then what we're really looking for are, do you have these qualities that we know make for good foreign service employees? And we go into detail on our website about what we mean by these. Um, but the process that we go through to try and evaluate whether or not folks are going to be successful in the Foreign Service is a bit complicated. It's a, it involves three phases of evaluation. Um, the first phase for everybody is to complete the application and submit what we call personal narratives. These are six short essays in which you give us examples of how you exhibit those qualities I just talked about. Um, once your application's in, uh, then you go through that, that, that first one is a, is a, do you have the knowledge we want you to have? So for specialists, it's really, do you have the technical knowledge for the specific job you're being hired for? And for foreign service officers or generalists, um, it's, do you have the general knowledge that, that you need? And that is the kind of infamous foreign service officer test. It's a general knowledge test covering a wide variety of topics. Um, nothing super deep, but it is extremely wide. And so it can be quite hard to, to study for. We have a number of different materials that we offer to folks um, to help them prepare. And I'll go into that in just a minute. If you get through that uh, initial uh, check of uh, do you have the skills or the knowledge we're looking for, then your application goes on to a panel. Um, and the panel will look at those personal narratives that you prepared, the rest of your application, and any essays that may have been part of the threshold test that you went through. And they're going to score you against those uh, dimensions that I talked about. If you get a high enough score, if you get above the threshold score, then you're invited to the oral assessment. Um, only consular fellow program applicants are required to take a language test because we are hiring them for their language skills. Um, it's actually not required to have a foreign language to apply to the foreign service. Um, so only they take the language test at this point um, and they have to pass that language test to move on to the oral assessment. The oral assessment is a day long in person evaluation process. Um, and we put you through a number of different exercises dur during the oral assessment to again evaluate and elicit do you have those 13 dimensions that we're looking for. If you get a high enough score on the oral assessment, then, then you're a, a potential employee. Uh, we put you through a medical and security clearance, which you do have to get. Um, if you get one final review of your whole package. Um, and if everything checks out, then we put you on our list of successful candidates. Um, we call this the register. And we pull people from the register uh, to form orientation classes. Um, so you're on the register and we'll give you a call and say, hey, we're forming a class in two months. Um, would you like to take a seat in the class? Um, you can say no um, once. If you say no a second time, then we will move you off the list to make room for other folks that maybe have lower scores than you who are interested in joining. You can stay on the register for 18 months. If you do not get an offer for a class within that 18 months, then you have to start the whole process again. 
This whole process from when uh, you might start your application to when you might be invited to an orientation class can take about 18 to 24 months. Um, so for me, it did take uh, 22 months uh, for me to get through the whole process. Um, so we do caution people to be patient. Uh, we do also say it's uh, remind people it is a competitive process. Um, the majority of people in the Foreign Service have gone through this process more than one time. Um, I went through it twice. I applied my first time when I was a senior in, in college. Um, I did not pass the oral assessment, so I brushed off my ego and um, plucked up my courage to try again the next year, um, and I was successful then. I know people who have taken it, uh, gone through this process three, four, five. I heard of an ambassador who had gone through this process seven, I think eight times. And um, so, you know, people who are incredibly successful in the foreign service um, still had trouble getting through this process. So don't be discouraged by that. Um, a couple tips on how to prepare if you're thinking about applying to the Foreign Service. One is definitely know the requirements in the process. I mean, I just outlined for you and gave you a quick rundown. On our website, we go into a ton of detail about the process. We go into each component of the process and give you a lot of information. We have a bunch of different guides too. Um, and I think Jennifer and Megan are gonna share some information with you guys at the end too about a document that they worked on to, to get uh, to capture some a good map of how to navigate our website. Um, know the Foreign Service. I mean, you don't have to know every single thing about us, but know what you're getting into. It's a good idea to know what you're getting into. Um, and we have some books that are available that talk about the Foreign Service, both the life and the work. Um, I also encourage folks to, to practice writing. Um, writing is a component of every single aspect of our evaluation process. Um, it's very important to us. So if you're out of the habit of writing, if you're out of the habit of writing short and um, concise things, practice, practice writing. Um, and then look at those 13 dimensions and do some self-evaluation. Are you ready to give examples of how you, you have exhibited those 13 qualities? Um, or do you feel like maybe you don't have good examples in some of those areas? And think about how could you push yourself to grow in those areas? Um, that's, that's really important to us. Um, we have a mobile app called DOS Careers, which has really good information on it. Um, in particular for the Foreign Service Officer candidates, it's got great inf uh, a great feature, which is a quiz, has uh, sections broken down by topic. Um, you can test yourself and get a real sense of where are your strengths and weaknesses on the different topics that the test covers. Um, there's also a couple of uh, monthly programs that happen through the State Department. Our Foreign Policy Classroom talks about current events, introduces you to, to current people doing diplomacy. Um, our National Museum of American Diplomacy um, has programs that look more uh, historically at uh, diplomatic engagement. Um, both are great. Uh, the National Museum of American Diplomacy website is really fantastic. I urge people to take a look at that too to learn about the Department of State and the Foreign Service. I did also want to spend some time on the civil service because the Department of State um, is, uh, we have these two halves. It's like our, our, um, you know, our, our yin and our yang. We're not, we don't work if we're not together. Um, and the civil service is a great career path, it, particularly if you're not interested in doing the moving around every two to three years and, and bopping all over the world. Um, but you really are interested in international affairs and in working on foreign policy. Um, all of our positions in the civil service are posted on usajobs.gov. Um, again, they cover the gamut of, of possibilities within the department. Um, and you really do have to look at each posting um, because, well, it might say uh, foreign affairs officer. Well, that could mean a lot of different things. It could be that they're looking for somebody to work on the, the Cambodia desk, um, or it could be that they're looking for somebody to work on nuclear nonproliferation or um, international environmental policy. So you have to look into the specific announcement itself to see what the job is. Is. It's very different from the Foreign Service in that way. With the Foreign Service, you're being hired into the core, and then we're going to assign you to different jobs.
jobs. Um, with the civil service, you really are being hired into a specific job. Um, you want to make sure that you're looking, uh, uh, you're following the instructions, completing the application. Um, with federal employment, um, a couple of things. Uh, you really want to make sure that your resume is crafted in a way that's going to uh, help you capture the attention of the hiring officials for the job you're applying for. Um, the Office of Personnel Management does webinars on how to craft a federal resume, and I strongly recommend those. Um, they actually have one coming up, I think, next week. Um, so definitely urge people, if you're thinking about federal employment, take one of those Office of Personnel Management courses. Um, they also do a webinar on how to navigate USA jobs, um, which I also encourage you to, to, to do if you're thinking about that, because there's a lot of tips and tricks with USA jobs, like saving searches so you can get alerts, um, how to uh, save your resume, build your account, that kind of thing. So definitely encourage you to take those Office of Personnel Management uh, courses. Um, once you've submitted your application and all your accompanying documents, your, um, your application will then go through an evaluation. Um, this is where things can get a bit tricky if you're applying in the federal service if you don't have non-competitive eligibility. Um, for those that were in the Peace Corps, you know you get that from Peace Corps service. You also get that from uh, military service. Some of our other uh, programs, uh, service programs, AmeriCorps, um, uh, some of our, our uh, scholarship programs like the Critical Language Scholarship, the Boren Scholarship, you get the, the non-competitive eligibility. If you don't have non-competitive eligibility, your application won't move forward until everybody who has non-competitive eligibility has been disqualified. And that can be a hard thing to overcome. So sometimes federal uh, applications can be frustrating for folks if they don't have that. Um, so I do want to caution you on that. I'm not discouraging you from trying. Definitely do. Just know that it's not necessarily your qualifications that are the problem. It's that non-competitive eligibility that can be a barrier sometimes. Um, with us, you then get an interview. Um, and with the, with the Department of State, all civil service employees do have to go through security clearance as well. Um, I do always flag the PMF program. Um, didn't some of you um, sounded like maybe you might be thinking about grad school? Um, if you are uh, and you do do a graduate school program, uh, I urge you to consider the Presidential Management Fellowship. It's a great path into the civil service, um, overcomes that non competitive eligibility issue that I talked about. Um, this is a very uh, old and very well respected program um, and encourage folks to take a look at it. Um, we hire in the State Department a lot of presidential man management fellows. We know how good they are. We definitely like to bring them into our organization and we give them a good program uh, in, the, in the Department of State. Um, I'm not gonna spend much time on this because it sounded like most folks were beyond student opportunities, but I always like to just flag, there are a lot of student opportunities with the State Department, tons of information on our website. Um, I, I'm happy to go back to this if folks are interested, um, but um, I'll move on from that so we can get to the Q and A. Um, and then finally, just to say, um, you know, I want to stay in touch with you. Part of my job, a uh, big part of my job is to mentor and coach people through the process and help them navigate um, and how to get how to get into the, the State Department. Um, I hold office hours. Um, if you're interested in staying in touch with us uh, about opportunities that are coming up, I definitely encourage you to register your interest with us. And then we would send you notifications when opportunities opened up. So with that, why don't I go ahead and um, stop sharing and see if there's questions. Hi, this is Omar and uh, you know, I'll go first and uh, hopefully everybody will be following after me a little bit, but um, I had a, a couple questions. Um, I was actually just trying to send you an email uh, through the website. And for some reason I can't send it, but um, I'll just ask the question here. First off, the, the test, so I took the test um, 
and maybe some other people are in my position too. So hopefully this is a helpful question. Um, the, I took the test in 2019 for the first foreign service officer test, did it without any studying whatsoever, um, really made a decision. It's been something I was looking, like looking forward to in 2019 when I took it. Uh, missed the, the initial mark, the qualifying threshold mark, I think by 20 points or so. And so I guess like, you know, there's, uh, if you look at the GRE or the GMAT or other kind of standardized tests, uh, you can kind of like gauge, you know, based on where you scored without kind of any, um, on like what things you could, given that kind of scoring, or given that kind of you know um, you know non-studying kind of background into the into the test, what could you recommend to really focus on going into uh, another round of taking a test, either in I think it's June or or October of this year? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is in June. So the application for the Foreign Service Officer position opens three times a year, and it's about to open at the end of April, um, with the test being in June, and then it'll open again at the beginning of September with the test being in October, and then again at the end of December with the test being in February. Um, in terms of um, how to prepare, um, I really do think that our app and the quizzes on our app are your best way to gauge how you're going to do and where you need to spend some time. Um, it, it, they're all retired Foreign Service Officer test questions, but the nice thing about it is instead of just the full on practice test, which we do have on our website, these are broken down by topic. So you know, okay, well, these are all the, you know, world affairs topics. These are the economic topics. And so then you can, because it's such a broad test, I, I think it's, you're right. It's hard to study for everything. Um, so this helps you narrow it down. Maybe you need to brush up on the US constitution and this will give you that flag that that's where you need to spend some time or I mean, in your case, probably not economics, but <laughs> so in my case, it'd be economics. Um, you know, maybe it's on, um, uh, you know, US culture or whatever it happens to be. This helps steer you and focus you a little bit. Um, and I do think that that's the best way to prepare. And then once you've spent some time on, we have on our website a suggested reading list. It is suggested. We're not telling you to read all those books. Um, and actually another intern that's working with me is working on updating that suggested reading list and, and actually bringing in some more variety, not just books, but podcasts and, you know, all sorts of other websites and things like that. Um, so we're working on that. But, um, but that's really the best way to start. Um, the one area that I will caution you is, is hard to study for is the situational judgment. Um, we have a whole section on the Foreign Service Officer Test that's about situational judgment. And that is hard to study for. Um, you know, you kind of, you have, those are things that you absorb. Um, I mean, as you know, you're, you're a professional, you have a lot of experience and that's gonna help you in those. Um, I think sometimes when people have less experience that situational judgment part can be quite hard. The best thing I tell people is, um, you know, uh, take a look at like business school case studies, um, look at leadership, uh, listen to some TED talks. <laughs> Unfortunately, the situational judgment one is hard to, you can't really study for it. You can just kind of be familiar with leadership principles. Hopefully, is that, does that get to your question a little bit, Omar? It sure did. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, a couple of things I, I definitely saw on the website were, uh, were helpful. Um, and I guess like you're just, you know, like anybody else uh, who's a human, you want to use your time as smart as possible, especially if you have kids or if you have, you know, again, a career that you have to kind of focus on. Um, and so you just want to use your time as efficiently as possible. And so I guess the second, you know, part to that would be generally like you can read everything on the internet. If you just, you know, if you look for it, you can find affirmation uh, in the deep depths of the internet if you want to. But there's lots of things about this test and, and how long you should then prepare. Um, I guess what's your your best judgment. I know it's case by case basis, but how long do you think, you know, somebody should be preparing for this? 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of studying, well, I will, in terms of studying, I don't, there's not a time frame I can give you. It's just kind of when you know that you're ready to, to do it. I, the one, what I will say is that I caution people against overly focusing on the foreign service officer test and not focusing enough on the personal narratives. Um, because the foreign service officer test, you know, it's general knowledge, you, it's scored and basically the same day, you know, whether or not you passed or not. Um, and then you're, if you pass, your application then moves on and that panel is going to spend a lot more time on your personal narratives than the three hours you're spending on the foreign service officer test. So I do always want to make sure people are paying attention to how important those personal narratives are. Um, there is a lot of information on our website um, about what we expect out of those. The one piece of information that's not on our website, which is public information, is that each um, narrative is only 1300 characters. So they're very short. Um, and you have to pick an example that's going to be um, evocative and impactful. And then the challenge for you is to write it in a way that's captivating and expressive and convincing. <laughs> so, um, and all of that in 1300 characters, which is really hard. Um, so, you know, that I think I encourage people to spend, um, you know, just as much time on those as you would on preparing for the test itself. Um, and I just saw in the chat that Tabitha said the tiny URL goes back to sign up for tonight's event. It looks like that, and I should have mentioned, it looks like you're registering for this event, um, and that drives me crazy, but <laughs> um, you're not. You're, that's for us to remember how we met you, um, but it is really a sign up. It's not registering for the event, so sorry about that. Mika, I also feel like Omar's question does such a great job in segueing into the resource that Megan and I created that if you don't mind, I'd love to take five minutes of everyone's time. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. For those of you who are already Global PDX members, you'll be very familiar with our member portal, which you're seeing now. For those of you who aren't, it's a great resource. Uh, it, if you're an individual who wants to join Global PDX, it's $50 a year, or if you're a student, it's just 20. You get into all of these events for free and then so much more. Um, this, for example, is our free event code for this month. Um, and if you scroll down here and click Global Career Opportunities, uh, Megan and I have started to craft, um, or Global Career Guide, excuse me. Megan and I have started to craft a guide that really gets to the heart of the foreign service um, exam, because I know that is daunting. That was a big thing that I was scared of when I was thinking about being a diplomat in college. I just thought it was ominous. I didn't know how to study for it. So um, what Megan and I have done is create this guide, helpful links and websites. Um, it's open right here as well. And Megan, I think with your approval, we should just share this with everybody in sort of our post event roundup that we'll be sending to all of you, which will also include a recording of this session. It's got some really incredible links here that anybody can use and utilize. Um, and then also on this resource, we're collecting a lot of other information from people who've taken the test, passed the test, failed the test, all sorts of things um, that you can scroll through, really utilize, it's got a wide variety of different types of media. And then finally, at the bottom of this page is a way to network. Um, so we've got Megan here already, who's in the session with us today. We've got people like Sarah, who works for the State Department. When you click those people, you'll be taken right to their global PDX uh, profile, and that'll allow you to network further with them, commiserate, share some tips, uh, learn from them, and, and anything else you'd like. So if you have any questions about that, uh, feel very free to, to reach out to us at Global PDX. Otherwise, I'll turn it back over to questions. That's a great resource. <clears throat> Thank you. I it, it launched just today. So <laughs> be kind with us if there are any bugs, uh, definitely let me know. But I think it's going to be a really great way for uh, everyone to network on, on how they're studying, uh, maybe pick up some new tips, and then share advice. And Rachel asked a question in the chat. Um, 
about uh, choosing a cone or a career track, uh, those five that I talked about. And she said, but it sound like, sounds as though your role can shift as you progress through your career. Um, both are true. I will say um, I've probably done a little bit more bouncing around um, between uh, career tracks because I am a tandem. So because I'm my husband and I are both foreign service officers. So to try and stay together, we tend to try and be a little creative. Um, but um, absolutely, um, you know, particularly as you get more senior, um, what you want to be showing uh, is your versatility and that you can be uh, more of an overall leader as opposed to just narrowly focused on your career track. Um, so my last assignment uh, before be doing this job was as deputy chief of mission at our embassy in Skopje, North Macedonia. And as deputy chief of mission, my job was to be providing uh, oversight and direction and, and you know, leadership for the entire embassy, not just for the public diplomacy section. Um, so the fact that I had served in different positions uh, really was to my advantage because I could understand uh, you know, the different experiences. Um, you do in the foreign service were we're reviewed for promotion every few years and we're promoted based on our performance. Um, and when you're reviewed for promotion, you, the first thing they wanna see is, right, have you demonstrated you can successfully do work in your career track at this level and are you ready for the next level in your career track? Um, so that's the first thing they're gonna look at, but then they're also gonna look like, okay, well, has she also done something that's a little bit different? Has she tried different types of work, taken on you know, big embassies, little embassies, um, done uh, regional work or, or topic specific work? So there's, we're looking for both. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so it seems kind of like with the way that the Foreign Service Officer exam is set up and how the process works that um, there's like some more flexibility than maybe like a traditional interview where they're looking like exclusively at your qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think that there's like certain like maybe schools or jobs or something that would help you um, beyond just the exam? Like, are they drawing from like schools like Georgetown or uh, SIPA, Columbia, that kind of thing? Um, we have people who are in the Foreign Service from schools all across the country and from overseas. We have people who have studied overseas as well. Um, so we're not drawing from specific schools. Um, and, you know, we try extremely hard in our selection process to be very equitable in how we're approaching things. So, you know, um, I think even actually, I don't know, um, I think John Kerry said this at one point, but it doesn't matter who you know in the Foreign Service because that our examiners don't care. They're not gonna know who you know and they're not gonna care. <laughs> <laughs> they are only going to look at how are you performing now? How are you demonstrating your success in those 13 dimensions? Um, and they aren't going to care where you went to school and they're not going to care who you know. Um, so um, in answer to your question about kind of what experiences can be helpful, um, you don't have to try and seek out international experiences to be successful in our process. Um, uh, we have people who join who have never been overseas um, and they're able to demonstrate their ability to be successful in those 13 dimensions. And that is just, that is really what counts for us um, is, you know, can you, you know, if asked to give an example of how you have Im implemented communication skills, can you give us a really solid persuasive example? Um, and, you know, that I always tell people don't count anything out. You know, I, you have to not, the, the worst thing somebody can do is have the best example, but they think, oh, it's not international or, oh, it's not like, you know, professional enough um, and then they don't use it and that's to their disadvantage. Um, you know, before I joined the foreign service, 
the closest thing I had to a career was in the restaurant industry. Um, and I had worked jobs in food service from 15 and until literally the weekend before I started in the foreign service on Monday. Um, so, you know, my, I had every job you possibly could in a restaurant. That was the best preparation for the foreign service I had. Um, you know, learning to deal with other people, learning to persuasively communicate, learning to deal with crisis situations, learning to multitask, um, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, and I use, share that example because, you know, a situation as a waitress in a restaurant can be very powerful in persuading somebody what kind of skills you have that are gonna make you a good foreign service employee. So, you know, there's multiple different paths into the foreign service, not just one. Um, it just really is a matter of, we like to see that you've challenged yourself to grow in different ways and have taken on different tasks um, and different opportunities. Great, thank you so much. Any final question out there? If nobody's gonna jump, I'm gonna do it. Um, uh, so I'm hearing a couple interesting things um, in earlier in your presentation, right? It's really a generalist uh, that the foreign service officer is really you know, uh, training you to become. And that makes sense, right? Cause you, you have to be able to be flexible, have to be able to be put in situations that you know, maybe were thought to be one way going into it, but then end up becoming something different, you know, after you were, uh, were posted. Um, and so that makes a lot of sense, right? A lot of, you know, variabilities, a lot of flexibility, a lot of um, just being comfortable, being uncomfortable, be quite honest. And I guess to put that in con concrete, tangible terms for a document, meaning a resume, mm -hmm. would it be, would it behoove an individual to lean in their strengths, right? So I have, you know, generally, I'd say, I'd say I have a linear kind of career after, after at least college, at least, I have a definitely an alternative kind of career track. So I can speak to those kind of uh, adverse, you know, earlier career, but I'd say my more current resume is definitely the one that caters to that specific kind of career trajectory. Um, even though it has some international stuff that's, that's in it, so I guess my question to you then is when we then present ourselves, right, eventually in, in our writing, whether it's the resume or whether it's the, uh, the narrative pieces, um, it sounds as though, and please correct me if I'm not hearing it correctly, but that you would recommend uh, based on your experience and based on, I, I'm, I'm assuming the shared experiences from your colleagues, that pointing to how you're a generalist is, is probably the best route to go uh, instead of leaning into your kind of heavy, you know, skill set or like really the strengths of your career or things like that. Am I, am I, you know, kind of formulating that well? Um, well, no, I think, um, I mean, you do have to demonstrate that you can be adaptable and that you can, you know, quickly pick up different um, topics um, and, and handle a variety of different situations. But having an, a, an expertise in a particular field. I mean, in your case, finance and, and economics, that's also great. You know, we, you know, if you were to then be seeking an assignment, you know, a career in the economic track, you know, that would definitely speak to, to your eligibility for it. I, I think, and I hate to keep harping on the 13 dimensions, but really and truly, that is the key to our process. Um, once you check the general knowledge, the foreign service officer test, that's great. Okay, you're smart enough. We're not going to talk about that again. We don't, we don't need to talk about your smarts anymore. <laughs> you got that covered. At this point now, we really are going to be focusing on the 13 dimensions over and over and over again. Um, and what you want to do in that case is you want to use your experience, your extensive professional experience then to pull out the, the good examples of how you have, how you, you show leadership, how you show innovation, how you show, and, and if they're all about, you know, your, your more recent 
focused career path, that's okay. You want to pick the ones that are going to best highlight your skills, regardless of whether or not, you know, they, they don't need to show that you're doing a variety of sort of generalized work on different topics. You want to just worry about what does it show about me and my skills? Um, and if you've been doing, you know, a focused professional career track in a particular area for the past 10 years, and that's where your examples are all going to be drawn from, that's okay. Um, but what you want to try and do um, is use different examples. I mean, you don't want to have, you know, your six essays all about like the same three examples. Um, that's not as compelling. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It does. Thank you. Okay. Well, everyone, I see that we are at time, although I hate to cut this off because I know that Nika is a wealth of knowledge for all of us. But as she said, she is very available. And I know personally, she's great about connecting and answering questions like this. So we'll be sure in our roundup, which should reach all of you tomorrow, that we include all the resources we've uh, referenced today in this session, as well as some good contact information, which is also in the chat. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mika. We really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming. I hope that we see you again in another Global PDX event. We have them every month, if not more. Um, and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about Global PDX and what we're doing. Thanks so much to all of you. Have a great thanks, rest of your Jennifer. evening. Thank thanks, you. Everyone.